Welcome to the Ask Dave Anything series. We're back for more. Uh, last time I was doing the game industry and I missed some questions that people really wanted me to answer. So I'm going to answer those first and then we're going to talk about game studios. So <clears throat> uh, let's just get right into it. Uh, question one. If you could give only one sentence of advice to someone who is into game development and wants to have a career in the industry, as long as I have had, uh, what would you tell them? Uh, <laughs> stick with it. Uh, don't give up. <laughs> the, the game industry can batter you around and treat you like crap. Um, ultimately, if you love games, uh, stick with it and keep learning, keep playing games, keep loving games, and eventually you'll sort of come into your own because you'll have so much experience that no one can deny it anymore. <laughs> um, you know, I've worked at a variety of studios, but uh, a lot of, there was a lot of gaps uh, that were detrimental to my, my resume. And during those gaps, I just spent a lot of time playing games and reinvigorating my knowledge and uh, analyzing those games that I was playing and understanding what was in those games and tearing down systems. Just keep at it. Eventually you'll, you'll find your place in the industry. There's room for everybody here. There really is no end to how many people will love and play games. And um, as long as you constantly build that knowledge base, you'll, you might fail a lot. In fact, you might fail your entire career but you'll you'll still be making games and working on things that you love so <sighs> just keep at it <laughs> um question number two how can i become a game developer is there a program for becoming a professional developer especially game designing character designing models maps designs guns etc like you how can i get started in it uh it really is just about building that knowledge base so the best way to get started in it is to, if you're focused on one particular thing, to pursue that while you're playing games and understand, like if it's game design, you wanna understand the game design systems in the games that you're playing and really evaluate what a game play system is and what are all the mechanics in that system. And, and, and that store of knowledge builds up over time and eventually you just are able to pull from it whenever you need something for a new design. Uh, in terms of like character designs and things like that, it's really just like looking at different art styles. Um, but I'm not an artist, so in, in terms of like narrative uh, character design, that is a byproduct of building up a store of knowledge of all the different characters from all the books and things that I've read and all the characters I've encountered in games over time. And um, actually one thing I would recommend is uh, there's a tropes. I think it's, I think it's even called tropes.com. Uh, but uh, if you go to that site and you look up character tropes and stuff, having those things just sort of rolling around in your head as a, as a backstore to pull from, it actually will help you create a, a lot of unique characters. And I'm into this new thing where um, it's actually a set of cards, a deck of cards for like character elements that you can sort of like pull from this deck and come up with characters that way. You don't necessarily use all of them, but it just gives you like a, a basis to start from. So there's so many ways to do it. Um, but, but really, if you want to be a game developer, you just have to start making games these days, because as soon as you're making a game, uh, you're, you've got, uh, basically if you're making a game, you're, creating experience towards becoming a game developer and that's all you really need so what more could you want uh question number three why do i feel like games are releasing with less content than before especially AAA games with more bugs and worse performance eg star wars bf2 soul caliber 6 halo infinite see call of duty i have the impression the content is also less customizable uh, the reason you feel that way is because it's true. <laughs> games are releasing with less content. A lot of them focus only on multiplayer, and this is part of the problem with games as a service. They're not providing complete experiences, and it's also a problem with the expense uh, and cost of developing games, especially in the AAA area, wherein they need to release something sooner rather than later in order to have some sort of income to justify more development, and then if that 
and then you get this incomplete game and then you're like why would i even want to play this in the first place so games like anthem for example which might have had a complete story release without a complete incoherent story and and it's just garbage and you know when you're when you're a studio known for telling great stories and you get a garbage story out of them well guess what uh, your game fails um so the reason you feel that way is because that's what's happening. They're just releasing with less content and they're trying to maximize the income from selling you additional content. Question number four, the crowdsourcing question. <clears throat> this is a long one. I feel an urge to contribute to game dev or fiction in some way, but I am not in a good position to work on the game myself. Instead, I'd like to freely give up small pieces of content or design for game devs to pick and choose from. So I'm wondering how I should go about doing that and what kind of content would actually be helpful. What tasks in your work as game dev, <clears throat> as a game dev would be a good fit for crowdsourcing? And what level of detail or brevity would be most suitable for this to be useful? And then they give some possible examples. Um, right, so the problem with <laughs> sort of being a arbitrage crowdsourcer is that um, it's really up to those individual companies what or groups or however it's done what they feel would be useful so what you're actually asking is uh, is is how to be an effective freelancer because that's effectively what you would be doing you would find something that they need and you would basically be offering your services to do that for them so uh, yeah become a freelancer <laughs> and then uh, if you have skills in specific areas, that's what you offer. Um, so it could be game designs, it could be tech demos if you're good at that. Basically, look for a niche that you're super good at that's lacking in other places, which uh, often can be something just as like being experienced at, at game development. And if they're a junior team, you know, maybe they'll, they'll offer whatever. <laughs> It depends on if you want to get paid, I guess. <clears throat> and um, if you want to contribute, just find things that you can contribute to um, and and send it to them. Actually, you know what? Don't do that. Jesus, what am I saying? Here's the problem with... Uh, if they're not asking you for the work, they can't use it. Because legally, they can get into trouble uh, if they use your stuff and then either don't credit you or you can make a claim to owning a part of their game like there's just so many problems with that so what i would do is if you really are invested in like contributing to various games or fiction in some fashion is to create an open source license for whatever you're going to do create it put it out there and then draw attention to it with like a simple website or something like that hey if you need this or that for whatever game here is my writing or narrative design or here's some modular level pieces that you guys can use it's open source feel free to use it i you know uh, please attribute me but you know otherwise it's free to use um that would be the only way that i think would be reasonable to go about it and potentially even get used um, and one way that people do that is to have their assets on the Epic Store or on the Unity Store and simply have them be free. And that's a great way to go about it because when people are looking for stuff, that's typically the two main engines that they're going to be looking for stuff in. If they want to create a space game and you create modular level designs that, that are for a spaceship, they'll go and get it. I just did this recently uh, for a, a real project and it was very useful. So that would be my recommendation. And then if you see a lot of your work coming up in different games, you can go, hey, look, that was me. And now you've got an avenue to doing freelancing and maybe doing custom stuff and so forth. So it really depends on your end goal. But I would say open source, put it to an engine, uh, put it in their store and make it free. That's the easiest way to go about it. Game industry, question number five. What's your opinion on the hyper-specialization of roles in modern AAA game development? Uh, it's a bit of a loaded question, so I don't want to be biasing you one way or another, but what I mean by hyper-specialization is how we have roles with very specific scopes and responsibilities, 
like a narrative system designer or a games economy designer or enemy AI systems designer. My opinion on the hyper specialization of roles uh, in AAA game development is that it's somewhat necessary for larger games, but also very detrimental to the cohesive vision of a game. So in MMORPGs, you'll see that there's very hyper specialized roles. Like there's one guy who just does items and he might even do just one area where he does items or he might just do items for drops. And there's another items guy who does drops for uh, epic bosses and things like that. Uh, what I found frustrating about working on WoW early on was that I would be designing these quests and I could make the characters and I could place certain things in the world, but I couldn't make an item. I had to rely on the items guy for that and he would, and I actually did request a specific item for a specific thing and I said, could you make an item for this? And he was like, oh, I've already used up all the slots for that area and there's nothing like that that I can put in there. And I'm like, what the fuck? So I can't have this obvious rogue quest to give you a really cool dagger based on the character's name. And he's like, oh, sorry, no. Now, I don't know if he was just being facetious or didn't like me, but <clears throat> either way, that's the sort of thing that wouldn't happen in a game like Warcraft 3 where I've com had complete control over the level. So every little element in any of my Warcraft 3 levels I had complete control over. So I could do a little Easter egg or a little side quest to do a camera move, drop an item, rename the item to whatever, um, have a special monster that was scaled up and tinted a different color. Like I could do literally anything. And I think that sort of authorial influence is more cohesive if that person can do all those things within one section of the game whereas as we become more hyper specialized we lose that cohesive vision and it becomes more mechanical especially if those people aren't working together or don't even talk to each other might even be in different buildings or in a work from home situation never talk to each other at all i think that's bad <clears throat> because that cohesiveness is what typically makes games feel special and like it's there's like a single visionary behind it even when it's not true and there's multiple people but you get the basic idea um question six for game industry any insight into the global gaming market i.e japanese versus american versus european versus australian development styles how do you think those will affect blossoming game development countries like mexico south africa australia brazil we have Brazil, uh, Australia in both uh, examples, so I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, in terms of development styles, Japanese is very different from American, is very different from European. I don't have any insight into Australia or uh, any of the starting up companies, uh, except for I can talk a lot about China and a little bit about Thailand. So. Game development in America is very much a top-down hierarchical thing where there's usually like a director of some sort who's at the top and it's his vision for the game and everything sort of flows from that. It really depends on the game though, so there's a lot of different styles in America. So there, there are more team efforts, like Warcraft 3 was definitely like more of a team effort as compared to say uh, Bioshock, which was more of a uh, visionary single single visionary focused um in japan it's very much like a godlike auteur <laughs> who dictates an entire game uh and they do a waterfall waterfall style of game development whereas in america there's a lot more agile studios wherein um so in waterfall the guy at the top dictates this and this has to be made and this has to be made and this has to be made whereas in agile let's try this and we'll create a group and we'll try this game system or game mechanic and then we'll iterate on that and see if it's working. Um, Europe is also very much in the agile and maybe even less authorial, but it depends on like the specific country. So for example, Germany has this weird thing where there's a product owner and that guy will literally dictate everything and have final say on everything. And, which is scary <clears throat> because often they don't know anything about game design and that's not really a good position to be in. Um, whereas uh, Sweden, for example, is very much a team-oriented thing and they want everyone on the team to feel like they're contributing. 
So it, like literally the personalities of these countries come out in the way that they have these game development styles. Um, so it's, it's quite interesting. Um, and I, in China, they also have a sort of dictatorial waterfall style where there's um, the project owner who is typically got that position through nepotism. <laughs> he knew someone at the top of who owns the studio and thus they have total control and they can say whatever they want and do whatever they want. And it's often a mess because those people typically don't know what the hell they're doing. And it's been very frustrating working with the Chinese companies in that regard. Whereas um, in Thailand, it's a very much more laid back that I've seen uh, from the very few studios I've had interactions with and are much more open to listening to different ideas. But it's, it's a very junior industry here. So there's not a lot of experienced voices. And so there's some obvious frustrations because they're putting stuff out there and it's not getting seen and they just don't have the industry know-how to, to get things seen. So maybe that's something I should help with in Thailand. Anyways, so uh, I just wanted to wrap up those game industry questions.